Hello, everybody out there. Welcome to Option at Experimental Sound Studio every Monday night through the end of June. Uh, we are very, very pleased tonight to have New York-based cellist and composer Eric Friedlander with us. Hey. Um, hey, hey, Eric. Hi. How are you doing? You doing all right? Good. Excellent. Great to hear. Um, we're gonna spend an hour with Eric. We're gonna we're gonna talk about things. We're gonna cut in and out of some uh, some of his uh, some duo music with a couple of great artists. Um, as always, feel free to donate during any time during the program. All the money goes straight to the musicians. And um, without further ado, I will want to get started. Um, Eric, if it's okay with you, I want to just start out with a uh, leadoff question and just basically a very general: How's it feeling right now in New York? Well, we're percolating a little bit. It's still not. People are, I notice, are starting to record. So, and performances haven't really gotten off the ground yet. But um, I did a performance at uh, one of the bigger um, performance spaces here in Brooklyn called Roulette, and sure. they were still no audience, just internet. And so it was that strange kind of vibe where you're performing for. For people, but you don't really know them, see them, yeah. feel them. <laughs> so it's still, still, you know, the stone hasn't started rolling yet. I mean, I, I expect it too soon, but the yeah. big institutions are being very conservative. Got it. I understand. And, uh, I think that's understandable. Yeah. And um, have you done any um, any kind of like outdoor performing or anything since the? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't really. It wasn't in my zone to play outside. And cello is is an indoor instrument. Yes, <laughs> I understand. Yeah, I, I did an outdoor concert yesterday, and it felt as good as an outdoor concert could feel. But right. it's still acoustically, and you know everything connected to it. It's it's almost like the real thing. <laughs> right. Right. Oh. Um, maybe connected to this before we get into the first video, um, I would maybe just wanted to also ask you during the pandemic when it was uh, when it was happening, were you in New York the whole time? Did you get out of the city? Um, what was your strategy? We had a lot of bad luck. We we um, and some good luck. We had a fire in our building on the fourth floor, the top floor of the building, and the the fire department put out the fire, but the water at three thirty in the morning we were having rain inside the apartment and all of our stuff got soaking wet and it kind of trashed the, 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 the apartment. So we had to move out. And this was, this was April 5th, just the streets were deserted. No one was out moving. Oh my God. <laughs> it's like we didn't, we didn't know what to do. And so luckily I had apartment insurance. And so I called them and they said they could do everything for us. They could, um, pay for movers to come and move our stuff out, pay for the hotel we were staying in. Wow. Yeah, and so that's where it got kind of good. And we moved to Brooklyn. Okay. We spent a year there, the whole year of the pandemic, pretty much. Okay. And um, so I was living in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, with my wife and my daughter, and uh, we were just you know, getting by and the, the, the landlord would say every two months would be like, we're, we'll have you back in June. We'll have you back in August. We'll have you back. So pretty soon a whole year went by. <laughs> so I never really got, I, I didn't have a studio in this Brooklyn apartment. And so all I did was write. Yeah. And I did some, I had a, actually I had a um, travel uh, rig that I set up and I did some tracking for people and, it was, it was a crazy year. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, the place with the fire is that the place I visited you in? in yeah. Utah? Okay. Yeah, that was an amazing spot. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's it's really nice now. We paid the insurance covered all the re renovations. Fantastic. So we um we lucked out with that. Oh great. Yeah. Um. Yeah. What a year. But New York is just exploding with energy now. It's just like the streets, it went from kind of 
a little iffy to now just completely everybody's out and partying and going to dinner, sitting outside in these. Does Chicago have this too? These outdoor, like um, eating places. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Restaurant has like it's commensurate um, outdoor place where you can you can sit outside and eat. So it's kind of like Paris a little bit. I don't know if the ones in Chicago are quite like that, but there are certainly outdoor opportunities. And they actually, since the pandemic, like where I live in Evanston, just north of the city, a lot of restaurants kind of uh, uh, changed and created a new outdoor situation. Right, that's what... That's what yeah, so more those. yeah, yeah. So there are definitely more of those now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I want to I want to I want to get into some music. Um, right. The first tool I want to watch. This is a pan duo series, and this is something also I would imagine that's connected to the pandemic. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it's obvious enough. Um, but uh, the first one we're going to watch this amazing percussionist, um, and I'm probably not going to um, pronounce his name right, but it's, it's Satoshi Takishi. Is that close? Takishi. Yeah, amazing. I've, I've I've got a chance to hear him perform a couple times live. One on an actual kit and one completely on a floor with this amazing kind of hybrid floor setup. And, uh, yeah. Really, really fantastic percussionist. And I was watching the video you sent and it is really, uh, really great. So I thought maybe what we can do now, let's get to the first video and get this rolling. And then maybe we'll dive into some uh, talking a little bit more about uh, about music. Great. Sounds great, Tim. Great. So, Ralph, let's let's take this away and uh, we'll be back. This is Eric Friedlander on the Option Series at ESS. Thank you. 
And we're back, everybody, with Eric Friedlander. Um, you just heard a really nice duo with Eric and Satoshi Tokishi. Um, maybe we can start, Eric, by, by talking about your relationship with Satoshi. Um, when did you meet him, and uh, how long have you been collaborating with him? I met him in, uh, when was it, late 90s. Okay. Um, and early 2000s. Right on. Yeah, we, we met because his brother was playing, and we, I had a trio, and we were missing something. We, it was just a sax, cello, bass trio, and I don't know, I was blind to the fact that we need a drummer in every band you play in, pretty much. Of course you do. Of course you do. Yeah, percussionist, somebody to, because it's just, it just needs it, you just need it. And so he, he suggested his brother, and his brother was great, and um, that's when he played, we played in a band called Topaz for... Okay. Like 12 years and um, did like four or five records and I've been working with him. I, I do some film scoring occasionally and um, he uh, he often works for me doing that and he's, he's just irreplaceable. He has so many colors and sounds and work for film. Yeah, I was going to ask you if uh, if you guys were mostly doing free improvised music together or if you're doing written stuff as well. And if you're doing film scoring, I'd imagine it's probably, well, probably both, but you're probably both, doing yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Guided improv and stuff like that. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah really fantastic. Um, yeah. I was listening to... So, uh, yeah, yeah, I can. You can. You can just sense that when you're listening to you guys work together. It's really just really clear. It's really clear. It's very nice. Really nice. Um, I was listening to. Uh, I, is is Sentinel? Would that be? Is that your latest recording, Sentinel? Yes. With, yeah, I was listening to that. Really great and completely different from, of course, what you're doing with with what we just heard. Right. Um, all pieces, and I was reading a little blurb about how. Um, how it's a garage band for 2020 and that the group's live feeling um, minds the silence of the 1970s electric guitar virtuoso that, that, that provided a soundtrack to, to Eric's teenage years. So I, I wouldn't, wouldn't mind talking for a minute about your teenage years and just who yeah. were those guitar players? <laughs> John, Eric Danger, yeah. Hendrix, um, Robin Trower, um, Steve Lukather, um, who was, there was a guy from Yes, I liked him too. Oh my God, I, 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 I'm not, I, yeah, I don't remember, to be yeah. honest. Maybe someone will, in the chat will, will put it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and you started on guitar before it's cello, correct? Yeah, I started at like age five, I started playing guitar and then I went to school in the third grade. They offered cello or violin, and I guess I was a taller kid or something. They said, you're going to play the cello. So that's that where it started. Thing. It started. Wow. Yeah. Um, they, had a, they had a pretty bad cello for me, but it was the school, so we yeah. didn't have to play one. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and at least you had a music program. Right. <laughs> Not all schools do. <laughs> um, and you grew up in a household that was, uh, I would, I would, I would, I would guess, very supportive of of the arts in general, especially to, you know, when you when you look at who your father was, the great photographer Lee Friedlander. Um, I imagine he was supportive of artistic endeavors. <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely was. Um, but more, I think more importantly, he played music all the time in his dark room, and, and it, he had it rigged so it would play in the living room and then go down to his dark room, and uh, so he loud music in the house all the time, and he made mixtapes of R&B and classical and jazz, and and he was just, uh, he was uh, like a music lover, and it, it really meant something to him to be listening to music, and um, he had it in his truck. He had a, one of the first people, at least I knew, I didn't know so many people then, but um, who had a stereo system in their Chevrolet pickup truck. Awesome. And um, so we listened to music there. It was all, always everywhere. It's kind of daunting when I think about it. And 
in, in, in a mix, like a variety, like everything. It wasn't a hard, yeah. only hard jazz. It was like, oh, no, it, was, yeah. it was everything. Yeah. Fantastic. So I was exposed to a lot of different kinds of music. Yeah. Until I walled myself in my own teenage world of music, which <laughs> didn't share much with my father. <laughs> That's all right. You know, you got to go through that period to get to other things. Right, right exactly. <laughs> and what was it about making sound that, that was there a specific moment where you were like, okay, you know what, I could do visual art. I can be a photographer like my father. I can do other things. Was there a moment or a set of moments that really kind of like made it like a, a moment of realization for you where you're like, I'm going to dedicate my life to music? Or was it not like that cut, that cut and dry? Uh, it was, I kind of coasted on some natural ability through until I was about 18 or 20 mm -hmm. when I got serious. And I, I woke up and realized I was, in terms of legit classical playing and, you know, making a living, I was, you know, five, 10 years behind people my age. Who were going to be my competition? Yeah, and I had to remake my technique, and so I, that's like many many classical players do their practicing when they're young. I did my practicing between aged eighteen and thirty. Oh wow! Yeah, so it was it was tough, but I remade my technique, and I I became a relevant cellist in New York, which is what I wanted. I wanted to be relevant. Absolutely. And, and you went to Columbia University, correct? And was that for cello performance or composition? Or? I got a music master, a music um, degree, but it, I, it was not a great performance program. Okay, I was going to ask you, how, what, what was it in the early 80s? What was it like? It was, it was just the performance aspect. The, the, the composition and theory aspect was very strong in history. But the, uh, comp the performance aspect was kind of weak. But I did get great lessons with the cellist there who was part of the composer string quartet. And so I got free lessons. Well, not free. I paid for them through tuition. But, but um, I got a music degree, and then I just got out of school and started working. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're in New York, grew up in New York, and it's early 80s. There's quite a lot of things going on, and you right. just jumped in. And what's what's happening in New York in 1982? What were what were your first experiences? Who were you collaborating with, or what what was happening? What was happening there? I'd love to say I was open to all that. I wasn't really open to it. I started being a classical freelancer, playing okay. orchestras outside of New York. I would drive three hours to make $50 for an orchestra rehearsal in the Hudson Valley Philharmonic sure. or the New Jersey Symphony. And um, I just, I started, then I started getting recording work in New York and playing with a higher caliber of player. And so I started working and I pretty soon I got so busy. It was like, careful what you wish for, you may get it. I, I got so busy, I wasn't doing any creative music. So I started heading towards creative music again. And um, I got a, a trio with a violinist and a drummer and we started playing and we started playing at the old knitting factory. Sure. So Tim Byrne was there, Zorn was there, Marty Ehrlich, Dave Douglas. Um, it was my, Mark Rebo. Um, it was incredible. Yeah. And yeah. I just got my, my, my horizons just slammed open. Yeah. By what was going on. And what what you could do on the cello was being um, I didn't I never realized what what how much you could do and like I heard bands like Miniature with Tim Byrne and Hank Roberts and um, Joey Barron and you know they were just doing such beautiful music that was um, just ignored the conventions and um, it was an exciting exciting period and that, that old knit knitting factory did you have any experience uh 
maybe just sing or did you know Arthur Russell at all? Because I know he was in kind of that world, but he was always also kind of a little bit outside. Kind of hard, own, yeah. Kind of I had a, so yeah. a lot of his stuff since I never knew him. Yeah. I know okay. people who do, know, do remember him and knew him, but um, yeah, his uh, he's got a, a slice of history that he contributed to. It's quite powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, let's change gears for a second um, and uh, maybe do a, a, a lead up to the next video. I want to talk just a little bit about um, Ava Mendoza because you've uh, been working with her for a little while now and she is outstanding. Um, could you maybe just talk a bit about uh, how you are working with her? And um, I asked her to come down and do an improv with me and Chess Smith. OK. Uh, about five to three or four years ago when I was at the uh, the stone the old stone and we just did an improv and it was great she's hard playing and um she likes the sound of the electric guitar which I do too and um she's just been great to work with um so I don't know I don't know so much about her history okay yeah yeah California. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And because um, I, I was uh, li watching the video that we're going to about to see now, which is fantastic. But then to hear her in, on Sentinel, too, that trio with all the composed pieces, it's like incredibly versatile. Yeah. And uh, I don't know this drummer. This drummer. Yeah. Nobody knows. He's from Mexico City. I, I went down there and played a solo gig. And one of the concerts they set up for me was an improv with two players. And Diego was one of them. And he was um, just, I, I was really taken with his playing and he's, he's got, uh, he's got something. So I asked him to do this and it was, it was a difficult logistically, but it, it really worked out. And he still lives in Mexico city. Yeah. Cool. That's an incredible place. It's so beautiful. Oh my God. I, I played in a cathedral, and the, the entire city is, is, is built on an ancient lake bed, so it's slowly sinking into the ground, right? Wow. And this cathedral I'm playing in is leaning to the left, so like I could put a wow. drumstick on the floor, and it rolls to the other side of the oh, door. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, a phenomenal place. And, uh, just the weather and everything is so beautiful. It's at elevation, so it has that mountain weather kind of where it rains for 10 minutes and then it's sunny and beautiful and the air smells great and yeah. Yeah, I was playing there with, with Ken Vandermark and when we were there, he's like, you have to go to this museum of uh, archeology. span Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I I was there for like an hour and my brain was full. Yeah, you can't, <laughs> you can't stay more than an hour and a half or something. Yeah. So yeah. The Mayan and Aztec stuff is so deep. Really incredible, really incredible. Man, what a great place. Well, let's move on to the next video. This is one of your pan duos, and this will be a duo with Ava Mendoza. And this is, and I imagine from listening to all this, these are all improv like free improvisations. Correct? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, cool. So we're gonna uh, we're here with our guest Eric Friedlander at Option of Experimental Sound Studio. Um, we're gonna get to the second of three videos, and this is um, Eric performing with uh, a duo with a great guitarist Ava Mendoza. So. Um, we're going to listen to this and we'll be back shortly. So thank you for being here, everybody.
Welcome back, everybody. We're here with my guest, Eric Friedlander, at Option at Experimental Sound Studio. Um, we got a question from the audience. Uh, Ken Vandermark is asking if Eric can describe his perception of New York area improvised music scene in the mid 80s compared to now, and maybe some pros and cons um, between the two uh, eras, I guess you can call it. Um, well, I, I think the, the 80s and 90s were a hot point for me 
an exciting time for me in it because uh, the knitting factory, when it finally moved, I don't remember what date it was, this place called Tonic kind of appeared and um, there seemed to be more places to play back then. Yeah. Maybe I was just engaged more in the scene and it just, it was, it seemed like we were, like at Tonic, we were getting crowds for gigs that we didn't expect to get crowds. And I, I, I did projects like I did a radio show with a live Foley guy and I scored this, my friend of mine who wrote the text, we, we went on an eight part radio show there. I mean, it just seemed like there were more possibilities to. to okay, yeah. Um, that's, I, I think it was just more, it seemed more like a greenhouse, like a hothouse. Um, things were really percolating, but I mean, it's still, there's still a lot going on, but it's just, it seemed like there's fewer places to play. Do you think that the city getting more expensive may have a, have a role in that? Like clubs can't stay open. It's harder for clubs. It's harder to live. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Think so. places like the stone get turned into condos. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of amazing, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> the people Happy living in kind of what was going on in that Second club. Street. Yeah. Uh, wow. Speaking of scoring, um, I was checking out the trailer. You uh, you scored um, a film called Nothing in 2013 called Nothing on Earth about the work of this uh, great Australian landscape photographer, Murray Fredericks, and his trip to Greenland. Could you want to talk a little bit about um, how you connected with him? And maybe just talk a little bit about that project. I can't remember the guy who was our was our contact, but it was a guy who was the was the camera operator on on many of his escapades in the Greenland and on the glacier. And um, although he was taking picture, you know, he was taking video himself. But a lot of times, this guy was with him, and he contacted me to do the the. And it was actually kind of harrowing for a while because. Murray had somebody else in mind for the music. And so I dealt with this guy who would kind of get on the phone with me and very carefully try to choose his words. But it was clear that I wasn't making Murray happy with the music. <laughs> and at some point, he just, just ended and, and everything was good. <laughs> but I, I don't know what happened, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's really amazing. Wow. Yeah, it's, I don't know if you've ever scored anything. I mean, it's just like it's it's a it's a different job, and it's something you got to get used to. Not being a, in, enamored of your children or yeah. your your compositions because they they could easily say oh, that doesn't work. That sucks. I, that's, you know, and just and your job is to say, well, thank you. I'll, let, I'll move on to the next idea. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like. What do you know about music? I've had limited experience yeah. for film. And yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Because they're looking for something functional that's in the background, basically. Unless you're somebody like Werner Herzog or Stanley Kubrick, who has like a very... Not saying that this guy isn't thinking about music in that way, but unless you're really thinking about why you're using music right. in a particular way, a lot of times you're, the, the, the composer is relegated to, no, we need... Get in here. We need this different. This doesn't work at all. And it's like they're not looking at the big picture. So. Right. But I got to say, when I watched the trailer, I haven't watched the whole film yet. It seemed to work really, really yeah, well. It works great. It works great. And uh, I recorded uh, I recorded the music mostly cello solo, but I ended up recording a record of it with, with uh, Satoshi and Shoko, the guy. Oh. And it just, it's just my idea of the music as it could have been um, if it was more of a music record rather than a soundtrack record. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone had more fun. Yeah. <laughs> I had experience doing this movie called Thoroughbreds that came out a couple of years ago. And the music was really, I was really happy with it. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. Great, I'll check that out. Thoroughbreds, absolutely. Yeah, it's a cool movie. Great. Um, maybe if, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind asking you a, uh, one more question um, before we get into another video. But uh, one thing I really love about your recordings as a leader is um, there's 
a lot of times there's a really nice conceptual element tied into the to the work. Um, I'm thinking of like block ice and propane, where it was really connected to these road trips um, right. that you take as a kid, or broken or the Oscar Pettiford project with the broken right. arm. Um, really, really just like well thought out conceptual elements connected to these recordings. Um, is that something that I mean, it's kind of a vague question, but how do you go about, okay, how, how are these conceptions, how do they influence the writing? I know that's a really big, broad question, but how do you choose these concepts and how to maybe just explain a little bit the process to how you connect, you know, these childhood memories of traveling with your family um, out west to writing these specific pieces? Like, what's the, what's the process? Yeah. It started when I was trying to play the cello like a guitar and I tried alternate tunings and I I was playing and, and it, it brought me back to kind of Americana music kind mm -hmm. of sort of music that I was was playing and it reminded me of the trips that we took when I was a kid and um, I became kind of locked in the past there with those trips and so they, it would cycle around influencing the music the music would influence the memories and it just started perpetuating itself, kind of took life. And um, yeah, but um, I think it's tricky when you have these concepts for records. It's it often happens after I write the music. OK, see a, a unifying thread and I can trace it back to like going to see a Picasso show at um, for Artemisia, my, my quartet record. Um, seeing a show where he did these absinthe glasses that were just kind of a second thought, but they were featured in this case and they were so beautiful and crazy. It made me think of absinthe and what that was all about. And then I got into Artemisia and the record. Well, clearly, I hope you guys were, were tasting absinthe while you were making yes. it. Right? Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's part of the gig. Like you don't get the grant yeah. unless you like really right. got you know? <laughs> live it. Live. The music sounds lovely, so apparently you guys can hold your own with the absinthe. <laughs> it turns out that I don't like absinthe so much. Yeah. I don't like anything that tastes a little too good when it's got that much alcohol in it. <laughs> it's very dangerous. It's very strong. It's on one brand that I can't remember the name of it, but that's that I like. Most of them are kind of cloying and too too strong. Um, actually, I wouldn't mind one one more question before we get to the next video. Sure. I just want to talk a little bit about how you're releasing music now. And since the music industry has changed so radically, and like more musicians than not have their own labels, whether that's just a Bandcamp release. Um, but you've had Skipstone Records for a while now. When you started that label, was it more of a um, physical CD label that you were starting? And then it shifted kind of more into a Bandcamp thing? Or, or are you trying to do both now? Or what is, what is your, where are you at in, in terms of releasing your own? Came your own? Out of frustration for the Block Ice and Propane record that, that was, I supposedly had a deal to release it and they kept delaying me until where I, I finally got the message and said, you know, I can't wait any longer. And I, a friend of mine who I played it for him and he loved it. He but we lost started, it. started a label, which just means I just came up with a name. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really, I don't have an office or, or, or a warehouse or anything. It's just a name and I, I'm really happy I did that because I own the, 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 the publishing and the record has provided a lot of licensing fees for me and um it's just it's just it just seems like good business now for for musicians to own their their releases oh yeah. not be at the behest of labels i mean i i i had good experiences with the labels i worked with but i'm just really happy to own my music and um it's it's tricky business having to pay for like a promote promotional person for three months or yeah yeah I don't always do that I I make I make CDs now but I only make three or four hundred I sell mostly digital it's it's a whole new I mean it was a there's a, there a great period there when Apple music was paying 
great money for tracks and and you could you could actually make some money from um the internet from streaming but it's all over with i think they realized that they were, that the musicians were making money so they had to figure out a way to make yeah. sure that yeah. Didn't happen. that didn't happen yeah <laughs> <laughs> A lot of like game, and we get those reports with 0.2 cents. <laughs> it's like I'd rather just not get anything, you know. <laughs> it's just like don't bother well, paying anything, or you pay me 0.2 cents. Hey, well, let's get to the third of video. Last, uh, let's get to the third video of three, <laughs> and uh, we can talk a little more afterwards. But I'd love to hear one more piece. This is also with Ava Mendoza duo, part of your Pan Duo series. Um, let's let's watch this, and we'll come back, and we'll we'll, we'll wrap it up with a few more questions, and maybe we'll take a couple more questions from the audience as well. Yep. So you're listening to Eric Friedlander on the Option series at Experimental Sound Studio. We're going to listen to the third of three duos. This is also with the guitarist Ava Mendoza. So uh, we'll be back after this, and uh, thank you for joining us.
Hello, welcome back to Option Experimental Sound Studio with our guest Eric Friedlander. That was the third of three videos with the wonderful guitarist Ava Mendoza. Uh, Eric, what's going on after? Uh, let's pretend that everything gets great again and we're able to travel and do a yeah. projects into the Europe, all that good yeah. stuff. What do you got? Um, I have a, a project with duo with piano. I got to find the right pianist for it. Mm. And, I'm, and then I have a, another quartet record with my The Throw Quartet with uh, Uri Kane, Chess Smith, and Mark Elias. Beautiful. That's my two most recent projects. And then Sentinel is supposed to go to Europe. So fantastic. I'll have to write another. And, Another record's worth of music for that, if that comes through. Beautiful. So I'm waiting to hear what, what Europe is like. Have you um, have you been over there yet? I have not. I know a couple of people who have. Um, I think it's kind of, the reason why it's still kind of tricky is because some countries are doing a little better than others. So uh, I think I think what I, my educated guess is it's gonna be easier to go over to one place and do a festival than it is gonna be to do a tour. Yeah, that might be changing. Um, um, it seems like some countries are really lagging in the vaccines, and some. I think the UK is actually doing okay. Ahead of, ahead of everybody, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it's a little bit of a, of a of a mix. There's festivals that are planning on doing stuff in the fall. I have friends that are planning on touring in the fall, but it's still not 100. percent It's still a little bit up in the air. Wow. Um, and yeah. So I, I, I would hope by October and November, the country, you know, the, enough of the population in these countries will be vaccinated that, you know, we can get over there. They're letting tourists back. So if you're letting right. tourists back, then, you know, you would think that you can probably do concerts. But, uh, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> uh, maybe one more question. Um, I wouldn't mind asking you before we wrap it up tonight. Is my my introduction to your work was through the Masada String Trio. Yeah. Maybe if you don't mind, just talking about um, working with 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 Zorn and how he approaches that band and just like, because I, I would I, one of the questions I had connected to that is does he take with the Masada String Trio for example does he take pieces that he writes for the quartet and augment them to the trio? or change them up for a string context, or is it always brand new material for that for that band? He writes a book of music, like 300 tunes, and then he uses different tunes for each group that he... Okay, yeah. cool, cool. So, yeah. and, and um, that group started out with a lot of promise, but we never quite reached the level that, that we got to, and then we, until we finally did, we did a lot of performing and didn't record, and um, then sharpened our wits and practiced our parts and got it to the point where we could play at the level that he needed us to play at. So it took a while, but then we also did something which is he conducts us in that band. Uh -huh. So he. You know, he has all these hand signals that he uh, does arrangements with uh, in live situations. And it was, we found that it was best to have him decide who's going to solo and who's going to um, not solo. <laughs> <laughs> That's very important sometimes. Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Reading my mind. So. It's important to have those things delineated. And this way, it wasn't on any of us to suggest that it wasn't on me to suggest a cello solo, you know, or yeah, like that. yeah, yeah, wonderful. So he us from the floor in front of the trio. It's, it's funny you don't ever see a string trio being conducted, but <laughs> yeah, that's it's amazing. Um, any plans? For that band that you know no, about? Yeah. No, it's 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 over. Okay. Mark Feldman has moved to Chicago. Yeah, we are very happy about that. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Yeah, yeah, we're hoping now that things are opening, you know, cautiously optimistic that clubs will start opening. Some of them are opening, and some of them are open. Um, 
we would we'll see, but uh, it would be a, it's a, definitely an asset to have him in Chicago. And, oh, uh, sure. Phenomenal musician. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, if you have to get tired of New York, you can come to Chicago too. I mean, yeah. people should just start moving to Chicago. It's cheaper, it's colder, but they've got <laughs> great food there. <laughs> it's a nice place. <laughs> yeah, it's a great city. I, you know, you can recognize a great city when you when you live in one. Yeah. Yeah, when you go to Chicago, you just feel it right away. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, Eric, it's been lovely talking to you. Really great to catch great up. Great seeing you again, Tim. Yeah, man. And thank you for sharing those great videos and, sure. and your conversation. It's really nice to talk to you. And uh, let's uh, hope that we meet in person again sooner than later. Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, whether it's in New York, Chicago, or maybe we're on a festival in Europe, we'll yeah. see. But um, let's let's try to make that let's try to make that happen. Absolutely. All right. Well, everybody, um, you've been listening to Eric Friedlander on the Option Series at Experimental Sound Studio. I want to thank ESS um, for hosting this series. Absolutely. I want to thank my fellow curators, Ken Van Emmerich and Andrew Klinkman. Um, and I also want to say that next week, uh, the great Dutch percussionist Han Benek will be interviewed wow. by Ken Vandermark and also by Terry X, who's in the Netherlands with Han. They'll both be interviewing him. So definitely, definitely check that out. That'll be at one o'clock Chicago times since uh, the interview will be live in Europe. So definitely come back for that. And um, I think that's all we have for tonight. So Eric, thanks again. And we'll see you in the near future, I hope. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Take care, guys. Take it easy. Bye.